thanks. Uh, that's a really long list when you hear it read out like that. Um, I'm a service design lead. Uh, I work at a company called Fjord. Uh, we do all sorts of things working in different categories from uh, you know, sports electronics, healthcare, a whole range of different things. And it's, it's quite important, and it'll come through in the talk, why working in different categories is quite helpful. But for the purposes of the talk, I really want you guys to think beyond just the UI and beyond the user experience and beyond kind of which devices it needs to go into. Um, and a lot of the focus that my work has been in the last few years is around living services. And I'm going to sort of dig in in detail around what a living service is a little bit more. But there are, there are three kind of key questions that I always come up with when I'm looking at designing a service. Uh, the first one is around is what is our relation to the invisible systems which kind of power these services? You know, we're using a service, there's a huge kind of backstage and support thing that goes with them. And, you know, what is our relationship to that? And then one around personalization. How do these services learn about us? How are they personalizing themselves to our needs? And when you take that a bit further and you look at personalization and where it needs to move forward to, it's around anticipating our needs, and in some cases before we even have them. So I have a lot of questions around these services when I start designing them. I think design today, we, we, we have a huge amount of challenges. You know, from kickoff to delivery, there are a huge number of devices and technology platforms that we need to consider that we're working with. You know, there's a vast amount of content that we need to navigate and consume. I quite often find that our devices, you know, they need to be responsive. They're going to be adaptive to the context. They're going to be agnostic or omnichannel. Uh, you know, soon they're going to have to be even more anticipatory and in some cases have very ambient attributes. I think th this, this quote really still holds, holds true to me. Uh, you know, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And to that point, I think while we've been so heavily sort of distracted by the shiny world of wearables, Google Glasses, self-driving cars, there's been another future that's kind of snuck in and started being become a lot more present in our lives and the services that we use. And that's what I want to focus on today, is really around this kind of anticipatory services and ambient personalization. There's a really obvious way into looking at this. And you, know, you speak to any technologist or data scientist, and they will go, right, big data, analytics. Let's talk about how we can merge different data sets to create context and create awareness. But there's a much more important one, uh, and that's from the sort of the human lens and the design lens. And for that perspective, I see it much more as designing our relationship with modern services. And I'm going to kind of labor on that and get into that in a little bit more. But it's, it really is this sort of what our relationship is with these modern services that know a lot about us, that tailor themselves towards us. So quite often with technology and products and services, we're often hearing that, you know, I just want it to do it for me. I don't really care. It just works. I, I, I don't need to know what it's doing. It just works, and that's fine. You know, I'm feeling lazy. Or just, I just haven't. I'm too busy. I haven't got time for any of that. To, you know, to be bothered with it. As long as it's working, I'm happy. And so, what, what's the kind of design answer to this, or the technology answer to this? Is let's make it smart. You know, let's let's have a smart service, a smart phone, a smart TV, a smart app, a smart fridge. You know, I, actually, I want to dig into the smart fridge a little bit more. You know, the thing that everyone loves to hate on the smart fridge. <laughs> you, you know, you can't do a talk about the future without talking about smart fridges. And I want to kind of zoom out a little bit and look at the needs and motivations that go into smart fridges. And, you, get, you know, if you take the core kind of needs, like I need to eat, you know, it's a fridge, it holds food, it keeps it fresh, I need to eat. So I started looking at this, this flow, uh, and, you know, if I'm going to work through it in reverse order a little bit. If you look down at the bottom here, you kind of, well, you've eaten your meal, you've got a little bit left on the plate, you put it into the bin, you recycle it, great. You know, in order to do that, you've got to eat the food. Uh, so in order to eat the food, you've got to prepare the dish, you've got to prepare the meal. And then you go back around, right, well, what is it that I want to eat? I need to choose what that is. And you've got to store the food, you've got to have something in my kitchen to, you know, prepare and choose from. In order to do that, I've got to buy it, you know, I've got to, like, purchase it, spend the money on it. In order to do that, I've got to order it. And then, you know, again, you know, in order to order it, I need to choose it. And, you know, the sort of prime need at the top is just, well, I need to get some food in my house, I've got nothing in, I'm going to be hungry. And my kind of question is, where should the smart live within this kind of need, this journey, this flow that we're trying to address here? The, is it the fridge that needs to be the smart thing? Is there a different area for that? So if you look at this sort of flow again, and, you know, maybe the need for food is driven through some sort of quantified self-service that's telling me what I should be eating because it's it wants to, you know, sort of tie in with the food that I choose. It's going to, you know, help me reduce my cholesterol, avoid diabetes. So it's giving me a diet. So it's telling me what foods that I should have. 
maybe it's the smart grocery store. You know, I shop online, it knows what I'm buying, it knows how frequently I'm buying these things, it even knows when they're gonna go out of date and I need to replace them. So maybe that should be the smart thing in this service. It should be the smart grocery store. But what about the bank? Actually, the bank's kind of the heart of it, you know, the financial side of it. Maybe it needs to be a smart bank. It, it knows where I'm spending my money, who I'm spending it with. Maybe the bank could be the smart thing and it initiates things in other areas. Possibly the whole kitchen. You know, I've got a connected home. The whole home is connected. It's a, a great modern home. Maybe the whole kitchen, you know, it's not just a single appliance there. The whole kitchen is smart. There's, uh, you know, different areas in there. So I'm choosing what to eat out of the kitchen. Maybe I've got a recipe, a recipe finder app. It's a smart recipe thing. It says, well, I know you've bought these things. I know these things are going out of date. And you've got this much time to cook. So, you know, here's a recipe that you should make. You know, maybe that's where the smart is living. Or maybe it's the cooker, you know, it's like everyone's going on about the smart fridges. What about the smart cooker or the smart microwave? You know, it's cooking the meal, preparing the meal. Maybe there's a smart cooker like Nest that can prepare something for you when you get home. Uh, or, you know, what about a smart fork? Great, you know, you're eating, there's a smart toothbrush. Why not have a smart fork that knows how much you're eating and it can factor those things in? Or even, you know, let's go down to the bin. The bin is smart. The bin has sensors in it. It knows how much you're throwing out. It, it, you know, it's tied into the groceries. It knows what's going off. So my kind of real question is with this, is like, why, why should the smart live in the fridge? You know, if, if the, the need for one of these things is I need to eat, why should the smart be living in that fridge? And then I started thinking that actually earlier in the conference, the, someone was talking about, well, what happens when, you know, the microwave is talking to the fridge and they're both smart? You know, what happens when they're talking to the, the bin as well and they're leaving the cooker out of it and the cooker's getting really disgruntled and it's like, I'm not part of this smart conversation. And, uh, and, uh, you know, and then who becomes the leader in, in the, the smart kitchen of smart appliances? Which one's the boss? Which one's the big daddy that goes, actually, no, that we're not listening to you this time, we're listening to you? Where, where is the control from that? I often think back into sort of early days of sort of servants uh, and butlers, and there was like a head butler which organized all the house staff. Uh, and, you know, so there's, there's a head smart thing that organizes all the other smart things. Yeah, you know, the, the kitchen staff and the... Uh, you know, the sort of linen staff, they're, they're, they're smart in themselves, but there's, there's an overall sort of person in charge. And I'm lazy, I haven't got time for it. I don't want to be that smart person in charge. I want something else to be smart in charge for that. But w what I really want to get into a bit more is just the, there are these huge invisible systems that power this smartness from the consumer, from the user point of view. It's just the tip of the iceberg. They see something, it works, it's fantastic, they're using it, but there's a huge lot of system behind it. So just like a couple of quick examples of some services out there today that are kind of smart or kind of doing some interesting things, or maybe just sort of some older things. So we've got the classic one of Amazon. You know, you might like to buy this. It's like, well, based on the stuff that you've been doing, we've worked out that actually you might like this. And, you know, fantastic. I brought an iPhone charger, and it says, well, you must have a Wii, and you must like X Factor. So great, you know, we recommend you get a Wii and have X Factor. And it's like, well, I don't have a Wii, and I'm not particularly interested in X Factor. But, you know, I did buy an Apple cable, so... Maybe that tells, tells you something. Yeah. Uh, you've got places like LinkedIn and Facebook telling you who you might like to know. And it's like, great, you know, you really should know these people because you went to school with them. And it's like, yeah, I went to school with them. I probably don't want to talk to them anymore, so I don't really want to know them on Facebook. But, you know, it's trying. It's trying to suggest who I might know. Uh, or what I might like to watch. You know, Netflix is there and it's going, well, because you watch this, you know, we're recommending you kind of teen rom-com with werewolves thriller. Great, you know, this, this is the film for you. Um, so it's suggesting these sort of things. But then you can take it a little step further, and you've got things like Nest, and Nest is going, well, I'm just going to anticipate, you know, you, you regularly get home about 6 o'clock, so about half 5, I'm going to put the heating on and get it nice and warm for you. But, you know, what, what's to say that it, it gets it wrong, and it's like it's, it's having a bad day. So it's like, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to turn your house into a sauna all day long, and then at 5 o'clock, going to cut off the heat, you'll come home, and it'll be cold. And, you know, this interesting things with these anticipatory services is coming. Or like Google Now, I mean, Google Now does a whole range of things, but one of the things is like, you know, when to leave. Uh, you know, it sort of says, oh, the subway's down at the moment. You know, you should probably take a different route. It's going to take you 30 minutes longer. You know, if you want to get there on time, you should probably leave now. So there are a lot of things going on that are, are smart and that are anticipatory and that are personalizing themselves to our context. And I started thinking about some things that, you know, might come up tomorrow in tomorrow's living services. And, you know, tomorrow isn't actually that far away. There's a lot of products that I'm working on at the moment that kind of touch in these areas. And take a mortgage, for example. A mortgage is quite a long-term commitment with a bank. And what, what would a mortgage service do for you? What does a smart and anticipatory, a personalized mortgage service do for you? 
Well, you know, it's, it, you log into your mortgage account and it goes, actually, do you know what? If you paid an extra £50 a month, you'd finish your mortgage three years earlier. And you go, yeah, it's not a bad suggestion. It's, you know, I might think about that. It's not bad. Maybe I should finish it a bit earlier, £50 a month. Or well, $50 a month isn't too much more. I could probably manage that. But then if you take that concept a little bit further and it's plugged into your current account as well and it goes, I can see that you're spending like $50 a month, you know, on Domino's Pizza. You're getting takeout like twice a week. You know, maybe you shouldn't be spending it on Domino's Pizza and you should actually be spending it towards paying your mortgage off quicker. And you go, well, yeah, maybe that's correct. You know, it's probably I shouldn't be eating so much pizza and, you know, financially sound to be paying my mortgage off a little bit quicker. But do I really want you to be making those suggestions to me? Do I want this personalization to be making these suggestions to me? And this is kind of getting to the heart of it. It's, it's, it's what the, the relationship is with a service that becomes very personalized to you, a service that's living. Uh, for a different example, looking at a different category, uh, looking at car insurance, you know, pretend that I'm a, a young reckless driver or just a young driver and I've got astronomically high insurance and I want a service that's going to give me cheaper car insurance. You know, I'm actually a good driver as an individual. Maybe, you know, the bracket I'm in is really reckless, but as an individual, I'm a good driver. Hello, I'm Gary Lineker. We all know car insurance has gone up in the last few years and that young drivers have been hardest hit. And that's because they tend to have more crashes than older drivers. At Ingenie, we're tackling this problem by bringing together a community of young drivers who are treated as individuals and rewarded with discounts for good driving rather than assuming they're all high risk. It's purely for ages 17 to 25 and you'll be welcome whether you have a full license or you've just received your provisional. So how does it work? Well, we start by fitting a black box in your car. As you can see, it's quite small and goes out of sight behind the dashboard. It's installed by a trained engineer at no extra cost, at a time and place convenient to you. But don't worry, it's no impact on your car or its warranty. Fitting takes place within the first 10 days of your policy, but you're still insured from day one. The box sends us information on your driving style including speed, acceleration, braking and cornering. Think of Ingenie as your co-pilot, providing lots of useful feedback on your drive. So, uh, disclosure, I don't work for them, I'm not trying to sell it, it's not the ad for them. But what I wanted to highlight there is this, this service is out there now. It's, it's alive, it's living, it's out there now. And they describe it as a black box. You don't need to know what goes on inside this mysterious black box. We're not even going to tell you apart from, you know, it's going to monitor your, you know, your speed, your acceleration, your cornering, your braking. And that's all you need to know. We'll give you cheaper car insurance for that. And my kind of question is, when you start thinking about the other things that that can open the door to, so it's got GPS laid into it potentially. I mean, it should have. If I was designing it, I'd put GPS in it. And, you know, then it, it knows which areas you've been driving in and if you've been speeding. So the next thing you know is you get a fine coming through the door in the post uh, or you get someone turning up to arrest you because you've been speeding and they've got proof through the data that it's doing there. Did, did I want to invite that in because I wanted cheaper car insurance through this service that's personalized to me as an individual? There are some interesting challenges coming up with the data that's being captured and how it could be used and where it could be shared. Take a different example again from a different category, changing jobs. So I'm using LinkedIn, browsing around, and it starts popping up a suggestion and it says, you know, judging by your, your search and sort of behavior pattern on the site, we think you're probably a little unhappy and you want to change jobs. And here's a few recommended places that are actually looking for someone with your skills and experience right now. And do you know, if you're interested, I can like, put you in contact with those specific people. And you're thinking, just, yeah, it's a good service. Uh, I quite like LinkedIn for doing that. It's, it's suggesting these things for me. It's relevant, it's personalized, it's anticipating. But then you, know, you take it a step further and you know, that same data, LinkedIn has this other service that they have with the employers and the companies. And they go, well, we can give you a breakdown every month of who's most likely to leave based on their activity on your site. Same data, different usage. It's, you know, it becomes kind of quite worrying as to what the cost is when you're personalizing a service and what the data is and what the capture is. How about something even more personal? Um, how about if the social network you were using could predict when they, you were going to break up with your spouse? What would it do with that information? What, what could it do? Uh, you know, who would it suggest? Who would it tell? And I think, you know, for me, uh, Alvin Toffler covered, wrote a book a while ago called uh, Future Shock. And it's this great quote, is there's the too, too much change in too short a space of time. 
And the problem is that although some of these examples I've given are just, just beyond reach at the moment, the technology is advancing at a faster rate. And as soon as it comes into practice, we're going to have to deal with these different, different scenarios of personalization, these different scenarios of anticipation, these different living services. And I think the emotion and, and the emotional aspects of personalization are largely going unnoticed. We're, we're so distracted by how cool it could be. It could suggest this and it can know that and save you money here and do these things. We're not really considering the emotional context of these things what it means to have that relationship with a service that's that personalized to you, that knows that many secrets about you. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Uncanny Valley. I'm going to assume quite a few of you. But it, in a nutshell, it's basically the, in robotics, there's a point when they try and make it so human, they kind of miss the mark a little bit like this one. And it just becomes creepy. And then, you know, it can go beyond that into actually this is so real, I can't tell the difference. But there's this, this dip in the valley where it just looks really creepy. So I think there's an uncanny value of personalization as well. And I think within this valley, there's, there's things like, uh, on the one hand, you know, I, I want you to know this about me because you're going to give me a much better service. Fantastic. I'm happy for you to know this information about me. The service you're providing is going to be fantastic. Then there's the next stage. It's like, well, I don't mind if you know that. It's not, you know, I'm not too bothered either way. I don't mind if you know that because I'm going to get some benefit from it. You know, kind of Google Mail, giving me ads. It's not too bad. And it kind of dips down a little bit and it's like, I don't want you to know that about me. It's like that, I don't want you to know. There's no need for you to know that about me. I'm not going to benefit from it. I don't want you to know it, but you've captured it anyway. And then that kind of dips down into the bottom bit. It's like, just how the hell did you know that about me? How did you know that I'd want like two tubs of ice cream this weekend because I was going through a breakup because Facebook told you? I mean, <laughs> this, how do you know that? And then the, it goes to the other way around, and then there's the sort of you know, surprising and helpful and delight. And it's like, actually, you know, it doesn't matter what it took for you to understand that about me. This has just been wonderful, and the service you provided is great. I think there are a couple of axes here. There's, you know, the, what is it that makes something relevant versus makes something creepy? At what point does it shift between relevance and creepy? Uh, and that, for me, is that kind of emotional aspect. And then if we look at the other side, and something that anticipates you. So some of the examples we gave before in terms of like where does the smart live in the kitchen or the, the food buying process, it's like, well, you know, what's the difference between advice and parenting? So advice is the mortgage service saying, well, actually just pay $50 a month more and you'll save three years on your mortgage. Parenting is saying you shouldn't be eating Domino's pizza and you should spend that money more wisely on your mortgage. And there's some interesting concepts to explore there. I think the key thing is we're, we're taking our audiences and our users that we're designing for into kind of unfamiliar human machine territory. There's the, it's, it's this uncharted territory of what the relationship is we have with these services. And we're, we're transitioning these relationships our users are having with the services, the systems, the machine, the smart. And it's kind of our job as designers to help with that transition. You know, when a service can anticipate, adapt, and automatically make a decision for me. Uh, you know, th it, there's a big, big shift here in, in choice being replaced by trust. It's no longer I'm making choices and I'm trying to navigate. It's just like, well, I'm trusting the service that I'm connected to. I'm trusting it to make the right decision for me, you know. And I think it's a really interesting time for brands uh, when you look at these sort of things and the types of services. I mean, what, what, just what if, what if Apple did banking? You know, would that be a brand you'd trust with your money to do your banking? Or what if Volvo did healthcare or health technology, you know, a, a safe car that, you know, does healthcare? Or even like Louis Vuitton or a different kind of luxury brand. What if they did takeout dinners? I mean, they'd be hell of a expensive, but, you know, you'd expect them to be pretty good. You'd trust it that it would be pretty good. And I think the problem with that is these data breaches, these, this trust with the, the, these companies and these services that are being provided. And on the one hand, it's like, great, I don't mind you knowing this stuff about me because you're providing me a better service. On the other hand, I'm kind of trusting you a lot that you'll make the right decisions for me and that you're not going to share this information with the wrong places. You know, do I want you to share the fact that, you know, you've, I've got an embedded sensor and my doctor knows that my, you know, liver damage is going up. I don't necessarily want my health insurer to know that. And I'm trusting this service that it's not going to share those, you know, that boundary. I mean, even more so, when a company has so much data on you, they can predict when you're pregnant, when you're going to be due, before you even know, before you've told anyone else. And then they get hacked and their data, you know, is released. What does that, you know, where does the trust lie within that? And how is your relationship with that service working? I think to that point, I'll dig into it just a little bit more. And there's, there's kind of two levels of personalization that I'm seeing out there in these new services and these new 
small areas. Uh, one is the invited personalization, which I've been talking about already. I invite you in, and I want you to be personalizing that to me. And then the other is the kind of uninvited personalization. I don't know if many of you have been looking at smart cities and what's going on in that area, but uninvited personalization is it's getting more creepy because I think it, because it's that uninvited thing. So in the UK, Tesco's have uh, adverts next to the tills on uh, displays. And as you're walking up, it's got a camera, it tracks you, it can judge who you are uh, based on your age, your gender, and a couple of other factors. And it personalizes the ads that it's showing you to that person. So it's, it's an uninvited personalization. If you take that maybe a little bit further and a little bit more obscure, there, in London there was a whole load of bins that had like plasmas in there connected up to the internet. They would show you relevant things like headlines or which tubes were running slow or which ones had delays. Fantastic, I'm walking to the tube station and past two or three of these bins. It says this one's got delays, great, I'll take a different route. And then you find out that actually these bins have got Wi-Fi tracking devices inside them and they are tracking any smartphone that has Wi-Fi enabled on it, and they can track things like the speed and how many unique devices, uh, and they're recording all of these things. And the more worrying thing is because you pass two or three of these bins and they're all connected up, it provides this company the insights into, let me just read these off, the, into uh, the behaviors, like the dwell times, how long you're staying next to something, the, potentially the places you're working because it can tell where you're dropping off and coming back on. It can tell who you're with because if there's two or three devices systematically uh, being tracked together at the same time, it can even start predicting and anticipating you know, what you're likely to eat and drink and some personal habits based on the data that it's got. And this is a very uninvited personalization. And the, the thing that kind of struck me with this is just, you know, they're, they're open and willing, saying this is, this is on the boundaries of what's regulated. And I think that one of the problems here is that the, the technology is advancing faster than the laws that protect us. And it's quicker for them to develop a new kind of invasive technology to release it out there or to have the ability to have their data hacked before the laws are there to protect them. The laws are moving at a snail's pace in comparison to the technology that's kind of invading our personal spaces. And the future, the future is full of this big melting pot of sensors, analytics, machine vision, algorithms, and so much more. And there's clearly some utopian aspects about that. I mean, if you're looking at just healthcare and what you can do through personalization and anticipation in healthcare, there's some fantastic things that we can do. But also there's some real dystopian things uh, that are coming out that I've sort of tried to highlight and touch on. And the, the reason that what I want to bring these up for is that as designers, we're at a real critical moment in our field. And I think, really, for me, it's the designer's responsibility to be, to be working out how our users navigate these new relationships. It's up to us to add some visibility to some of these things and to sort of push back on the product and business people and suggest where we need to be actually doing a bit more to protect our audiences. So I often think, like, kind of what principles, what quality should be in these designs that we're creating of these living services. I think largely etiquette. Etiquette is a huge thing uh, for a personalized service. I mean, God forbid we design a service that's as bad as Clippy and it doesn't even know when to shut up. I mean, you know, a personalized service, it really should be doing a lot more. Uh, and so th this is just a, a initial kind of pass at some of these things. But, you know, a personalized service should be really have a lot of discretion. I don't want it like telling tales on me that I, like I've pulled a sickie at work and I'm just sitting home watching Netflix. I don't want that reporting on me. You know, it needs to be appropriate to its suggestions. I don't want it to sort of be acting inappropriate and creepy towards me. And, you know, it really needs to be relevant and have some empathy to, to the context and situation that I'm doing. A personalized system should really be very empathetic. But then on the other hand, you know, if it's anticipating, it shouldn't be patronizing me. It shouldn't be telling me what I should and shouldn't eat unless that's what I've signed up for, you know. Um, it shouldn't be trying to confuse or obscure things. It shouldn't be this like, well, we've got this black box. You don't need to know what's going on inside it, but there's this black box of magical systems that's happening. And it shouldn't be dictating to me what I do. You know, if I'm trusting a service to make choices on my behalf, then it should be making reasonable choices. It shouldn't be dictating things that I, I don't want to be doing. eBay's head of strategy is, is really on this as well, and it's talking about ambient commerce, and you know, Amazon are now filing payments for ambient delivery. Uh, and it's really turning this trust over to the machines, to the, to the brands, to the companies. It's, and in order to do that, there's, there's this sort of ambi you know, ambient selection is be gonna become much more of a thing. Uh, all of the major companies are looking at ways of becoming more ambient. 
how do you answer the thing that I haven't got any time to do anything? Well, you just say, well, we'll kind of do it for you. Trust us, and we'll ambiently do it for you. We'll glean some facts about what you're doing. Like Nest, you know, you only need to use it a few times, and it starts ambiently picking up on what you would and wouldn't like and starts making those things for you. There are no more decisions needed. And when that's the case, I think there's going to be some real cases for, you know, the data made me do it. It wasn't me, honest. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're already getting that with some simplicity about GPS. You know, when we're following something and we're trusting it so much we can't even tell when it's wrong, I think the designers are doing something wrong with that. that you know, we, we've put so much trust in this technology and this service that's doing things for us, we don't even know that it's wrong. We'll happily drive into a, a lake because the GPS tells us that's the road. Okay, well, it must be the GPS is telling me so. So I want to just sort of uh, sum it up a little bit. And I think, you know, clearly people's relationships with machines is changing, it's evolving, it's moving into a different area. And I think as part of designer's responsibility, it's really design the relationship. Don't just be hung up on the UX or the UI. Uh, you know, from Samantha's talk earlier about omnichannel, it's really this, this service, this, you know, the relationship that we have with an organization, a brand, with a service how it transitions across different areas, different touch points. We should really be considering designing the relationships so much more than just the experience or just how it looks. Thank you very much.